Stupid boy, we used to call these the French fry lights. Uh, my body is mine. When we release our Mi Cuerpo es Mio 7 inch, a riot girl from Olympia accused Spitboy of cultural appropriation. The riot girl, I'll call her Becca, had ties to the Bay Area and she was white. Maybe she really believed the accusation. Maybe cultural appropriation was a new concept to her and one that she wanted to try out and felt it applied to us. Or maybe she was just pissed off at Spitboy because we distanced ourselves from her movement. Becca objected to our use of Spanish for the title of our record. She objected to the words, mi cuerpo es mío, which translates to my body is mine. Apparently, my body was invisible. Mi cuerpo es mío, Spitboy's third release, followed our self-titled seven inch on Lookout Records and our full length LP that came out on Ebullition. Mi Cuerpo es Mio was an Allied release, and we chose Allied because of our ties with John Yates, and because we had decided that we would not be owned by any particular record label, especially since, like the punk scene itself, record labels were run by men. We were grateful for these particular men, but we didn't want any of them to feel any kind of ownership over us, our music, or our message. I remember Karen framing our approach that way, and it made sense to me after experiencing a great deal of embarrassment from comments made during the release of the Kamal and the Carnivores 7 Inch Girl Band, which came out in 1989 when I was still dating. <laughs> Founding member Lookout of Lookout Records, David Hayes. It turns out that Girl Band was just a really good record after all. Yeah, it was! And with a brilliant cover concept inspired by Superstar, the Karen Carpenter movie. Yeah. On the cover of Girl Band, each member of Kamal and the Carnivores is depicted with Barbie dolls as had been done in the movie. We even found a brown skin Barbie for my doll and an Asian Barbie for Linda who played guitar. During my days in trench in the scene, I never tried to pass for white, but my nickname was Todd and people didn't always go by their last names. Familial ties were less important than what bands you were in, zine you wrote, or city you were from, and a lot of us were from dysfunctional families anyway. If you were in a band, you went by your first name, and your last name was the name of your band, Todd Spitboy, Adrian Spitboy, and so on. Before Spitboy, people called me Todd Bitchfight. Yeah. Although I looked quite different from the rest of Spitboy, my ethnicity didn't often come up in conversation, not in the Bay Area. In the 1990s, people were still trying to be colorblind, to not see race, or to pretend not to see it, as the case may be. It wasn't polite to talk about race, so I didn't really talk about it, but this one conversation sticks out in my mind. What's your last name? We had just played a show, and a friend of Karen's had come to see us play. Gonzalez, I said. It was an unusual question. Your last name is Gonzalez? Are you, um, Mexican? Yeah, I am, I said. This was sort of nice. People usually just said, what are you? How come I didn't know that before? I don't know. That's so weird, I'm sorry, she said. What do you mean, I asked. It seemed like you should have known that before. I've seen you play and spit, well, you know, you're a punk man. I never thought about you all being of anything other than that. Oh yeah, I said. I feel bad. She reached out and touched my knee. I didn't know what to say. Identity is so important and I didn't even see, see it, see you. I just saw spit boy. She went on. I don't think it's that uncommon, I said. It's easier just to see the short hair and the clothes, I guess. Well, I'm not going to do that again, she said. It's not right. After many years of race and class ridicule I endured growing up in Tuolumne, fitting in was important to me, but fitting into the punk scene the way I did then created a whole other problem. In conforming to the non-conformist punk ways, adhering mostly to the punk uniform, I had lost something along the way, and I began to experience rumblings of discontent that I didn't quite understand. I secretly listened to Linda Ronstadt's Canciones de Mi Padre and sang along holding long sad notes to words that, like Ronstadt, I only vaguely understood. I knew that the, my identity was the root of my confusion and discontent, so I began taking Spanish classes at a local community college. Learning to speak Spanish had been a lifelong dream. As a child, someone had given me a red hardcover Spanish-English dictionary, and I naively thought, if I read it every night before I went to bed, I'd become bilingual like the rest of my family in East LA. Later, living in the Bay Area and not being able to speak Spanish began messing with my head. It made me feel inadequate like a phony. I sometimes avoided going to the Mission District in San Francisco. I was working super hard to fit into the punk scene, playing in bands, going to shows, and volunteering at Blacklist. Still, I didn't always feel totally accepted or understood, but I felt really out of place in the Mission, where it seemed like everyone spoke to me in Spanish and was baffled when I couldn't respond. 
I didn't say all of this out loud when I suggested Mi Cuerpo es Mio as a title for the seven inch, because I didn't really have words to express that was all that was going on inside me at 25. Later when I did have the words, they often came out wrong, clumsy, abrasive, and alienating, especially in those last days of Instant Girl. But I suppose this was part of my process. Naming our third release, Mi Cuerpo es Mio, was an important acknowledgement of an aspect of my membership in the band that I felt was missing. An aspect of myself that I had been unable or insecure about expressing. Blame the scene, blame Tuolumne, blame America. It could have been any number of those things. Probably all of them together were to blame for my locura, my schizophrenic or closeted identity. I hadn't been at all sure that the spit woman would want to name our record My Body Is Mine in Spanish, but they did and it felt good. But being criticized by a riot girl was a huge blow. Like a lot of people, my first reaction to anything back then was anger. Anger is a good mask for sadness. I didn't understand right away that I wasn't really mad that some riot girl keen on accusing people of cultural appropriation who couldn't recognize a person of color when she was staring one in the face had attacked the band. I was hurt. Hurt because people didn't really see me and I had let it happen. For all the efforts I made to be heard, I had made myself invisible. People in the scene did not see me, the face and the body through which I experienced the world. At shows, I did not re register as a Chicana. I was just the drummer of Spitboy, and for some reason, I couldn't be both. 